first to have uh, Sebastian from University of Chicago. We will talk about the boundary regularity and support propagation in mythic games and optimal transport. Please, Sebastian. Hey, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, so I, I will be talking uh, about some, some new results uh, about uh, a specific system of PDE. So this is a system that I'll be talking about. Um, so this is a system that is has two equations. It's a cup is a is a coupled system of Hamilton Jacobi equation and a continuity equation. Um, the first one is Hamilton Jacobi, the second one is a continuity equation. Uh, we notice that the, the two equations are coupled by this nonlinearity on the right hand side. And uh, we have this initial uh, condition, which is a, a given initial initial value for, for M for the for the second function. So the initial condition is always a probability density. Um, and uh, the space domain is either is always either a subset of, of our D or the D-dimensional torus. Um, one assumption that is very common um, for the nonlinearity, which we will make here, is that uh, the right-hand side of the hamilton jacobi equation, the, the nonlinearity f, is an increasing function. Okay, this is a standard assumption, and I will I will explain a little bit what is what is the motivation behind the system, and 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 also behind this assumption. Uh, I'm not specifying what is the condition at the terminal time, but there's always a condition imposed at the terminal time. Uh, but there's there's two possibilities: either we prescribe the terminal value of u, or we prescribe the terminal value of m. Okay. Uh, in the first case, that is called the final cost problem, and the second case, it is called the planning problem. Okay. Uh, typically, the, the planning problem is more of a midfield games. So it's more of a it's more of an optimal transport. Problem, whereas the the final cost problem is more associated to mean field games. Okay, so let me let me explain the motivation behind the system. So the system, as I said, it appears in mean field games. I, I have a question for you. Just go back because oh, yeah, of course, of course. I, I I am more used to seeing the final the the final condition on U rather than the final condition on M. So if you put a final condition on M, uh. The, the problem gets, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not understand, yeah. So, so uh, I guess, I guess putting a final condition on M that will be more difficult, right? Or more. It or is, less... it is a little bit more difficult, but it is not a, it is, not, it is a small leap in difficulty, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, th that is, that is the planning problem where, where you are prescribing both the initial and terminal um, distribution of the players. And, and you're trying to see, yes, what, what should what should be the final cost given that you want that final density? Yes, there is a, a bit more difficulty in in, in that one. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So this system appears in in midfield games. It also appears in optimal transport. The, the the optimal transport setting is when you prescribe the initial and final densities. Uh, and actually, maybe maybe going back to this, when f is equal to zero, um, and and we have this prescribed final density, that is exactly the solution is exactly the, the geodesics of, of the optimal transport between two densities uh, with the usual quadratic cost. Okay, so this reduces just the standard optimal transport when f equals zero and, and we have the prescribed terminal density. Um, okay, so from a modeling perspective, um, the solution UM is the Nash equilibrium uh, of a differential game with infinitely many players. So M is the density of players at time t and position x. And U is the optimal cost for a generic player um, at time t. Okay, uh, and specifically, when is, what I mean by optimal cost is that U of x t is equal to the solution to this optimal control problem, uh, which is, is natural given that U solves the hamilton jacobi equation. This is the, this is the cost that the players are trying to are trying to optimize. Um, and notice that the this cost function f is is, is why it's not just a standalone hamilton jacobi equation. This is the coupling. Between the two, between u and m, and uh, from this we see that the the condition that f prime is positive means that the players don't like congested areas. So the players are trying to avoid uh, being close to each other. They're trying to avoid regions of high density. So so the more density, uh, the more the more costs the players are paying. So it is, is natural to to require this condition because it is sort of a, a condition that penalizes uh, congestion. So, 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 in a sense, that's uh, like in optimal transport. All the literature about optimal transport usually f is zero, right? Yes, so correct. To, the cost only depends on 
on your yeah yeah it doesn't depend on the uh, on m yeah okay okay i see mm -hmm. correct yes okay uh okay so so now that i now that i talked about the motivation let's go back to the system so this is the now i'm going to discuss some regularity questions so i'm i'm, I'm writing down the system again uh something that is well known is that standalone hamilton jacobi equations are typically they don't have classical solutions even even if the data is smooth. In general, the solution of hamilton jacobi equation is is not is not smooth. Uh, it is actually just a semi-concave um, in general. Um, and this system is, of course, is more complicated because than than a, than a usual hamilton jacobi equation because the right hand side of the hamilton jacobi equation is f of m, and f of m is not known a priori. So we cannot suppose that f of m is is a regular function. F of the the, the regularity of f of m has to be has to be established. So this is. In principle, this this looks. If we just look at the system like this, it looks like we shouldn't expect much regularity. Um, and and it's, it's two first order equations. The continuity equation is also not is, is not very regularizing. Um, and actually, until very recently, um, we we only had we only knew, on one system we only knew uh, weak solutions. Okay, so we have this this whole theory of uh, weak solutions by Pierre Cardaliaguet, um, who was started by Cardaliaguet. Uh, which uses variational methods, um, which um, of course, because it uses variational methods, it doesn't really give much regularity because that's just the nature of variational methods. Um, but uh, it turns out that with this system, uh, there are strong heuristic reasons to expect the solution to be much, much better than that. So to, to, be, to be smooth, at least in the set where M is positive. Okay, And that's what I'm going to discuss next, uh, the question of regularity. Um, so the, the starting point for this is an idea of Pierre Williams, uh, which is the following. It's something he discussed in his lectures uh, some years ago, uh, which is that if we have this system, we can uh, in the we can use the first equation to solve for m. We can because m because f is strictly increasing, we can write m equals f inverse of the left hand side of the Hamilton Jacobi equation. And uh, having solved for m in the first equation, we can substitute in the second equation, and we can completely eliminate m and express everything in terms of u. And if we get just one equation new, it becomes the second order equation. Uh, but the punchline is that this equation is um, elliptic. Okay, so this is a second order elliptic quasi-linear equation in the space-time variables. So, so notice that this, is, this system has a time dependence. So maybe we would expect to get a parabolic equation, but this is actually elliptic in the space in the space-time variables. If we think of it as, as as n plus one uh, b plus one variables, it is elliptic. So it has this form. Um, and the, the matrix is, well, it's, it's degenerate elliptic, but it is strictly elliptic um, if and only if the, this quantity mf prime is positive. And, and, and this is where we see the monotonicity or the, 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 the penalized congestion effect of the, of the assumption that f prime is positive, because it tells us that uh, the, the, the assumption that f prime is positive um, introduces um, regularity via this, this elliptic effect. Okay. So, so the matrix is, is, is going to be degenerate exactly where when M is zero. Um, and because of that, we expect the solution to be smooth, at least in the region where M is positive, because, because this is, is a solution of an elliptic equation. Uh, so where M is positive, we, we, expect, we expect smoothness. And this is a sort of a heuristic uh, computation because it doesn't really prove anything, but it tells us that we, we probably expect much more than what we would think initially when just looking at this first order system with the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Um, okay, so so after this analysis, basically there's two natural questions that um, have been tried to uh, uh, have been sort of explored in this topic. Um, the first question is, if the initial density is smooth and strictly positive, is it true that the solution is smooth and has everywhere positive density? So basically. If the players are occupying the whole space at time zero, do they remain occupying the whole space? And is the solution smooth for all times? Uh, that is the first question. And the second question is, if the initial density is not everywhere positive, so the players are not occupying the whole space, is the solution still smooth in the set where M is positive? Okay, so maybe maybe there are some issues uh, when, when M goes from being positive to being zero, but is it still smooth where M is positive? And furthermore, in this, in this situation, what is the shape and the regularity of the free boundary? The, by the free boundary, I mean the interface where the density goes from being positive to being zero. Okay, so these are two natural questions that we get from, from this analysis. Um, 
for question one, there are several results that I will briefly mention. Um, so the ones I'm going to discuss first. And for question two, those are the, the new results that I'm, that I'm going to discuss here. And, and for this question of, of what happens when M0 is, is not everywhere positive and, and what happens with the free boundary, nothing was known except for, for these new results. So, so this, this is a sort of, a, uh, sort of the, 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 first, the first result on this, on this question. Um, and, and of course, there's many open questions as well. So let me, let me start with, with question one. Okay, so previous results about the question one where M0 is strictly positive. So, so this, this first this result that I proved uh, a few years ago, which is that the answer to the question is yes. So if we have strictly positive M0 and we assume this other condition, which is that the limit as M approaches zero of the coupling is minus infinity. If we have this blow up assumption, the solution is smooth. Okay, so 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 this basically says the answer to the question is yes if we have this blow up assumption. W why this blow up assumption? What, what does it make sense? Um, this blow up assumption is basically placing a very strong incentive for the players to stay away from empty regions because it's saying basically putting an infinite payoff uh, for 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 um, occupying uh, empty regions. Okay, so 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 em the empty regions will not will not form thanks to this incentive. Uh, and now the second result no, about this. Sorry. Again, yeah, okay, I didn't understand. Maybe you, you, if you repeat your explanation, it means that if there is an empty region, people will go there to Correct. make it. Yeah, yeah. So, so you don't stay away from empty region. You, you, you don't leave empty regions. Yes, correct. I, I, I misspoke. I mean, it precludes the appearance of empty regions because a player yeah, yeah, will so, seek them out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you don't yes, allow sir. the appearance of empty regions. Okay. Yes, no, you're completely correct. I, I just I misspoke, sorry. Um, okay. And now uh, this other result, uh, which is, I mean, the, the, the natural question is, can we remove this, this law of assumption? Um, and this other result says that we can remove it so far only in one dimension. So in one dimension, uh, we don't need to assume that, that, that the solution satisfies, uh, that F satisfies this law of assumption and the solution is still globally smooth. Uh, and furthermore, we can also weaken the strict positivity of M0 um, by just requiring that one over M0 is in LP uh, for, a, for a sufficiently large P. Large P. So um, yeah, this is a slightly, slightly strengthens the, the result, but it still requires M0 to be almost everywhere positive because if one over M0 is integrable to some power, uh, it's still going to be almost everywhere positive. So, so these are still results that are just basically focused on question one, which is if, if, the, if the space is entirely or almost entirely occupied, will the solution be everywhere smooth? So we have this inside regularization result in one dimension, uh, but it still remains an open question whether we can remove the blow up assumption in, in higher dimensions. Okay, so yeah, in summary, uh, question one, the answer is yes, if blow up assumption or dimension one. Okay, that's, that's, that is what is known about, about question one. Um, and now the subject of this talk is, is question two. So again, just I'm putting it here again, just to, just to remember it. Um, if the initial density is not everywhere positive, um, is the solution still smooth where, where M is positive? And what is the shape? What is the nature of the free boundary? That is, that is, a, that is the, the second question. Okay, uh, now I move on to the new results. Uh, so far, the only thing that we, that we've been able to, to solve is in one dimension. Okay, so, so this the setting is going to be this one dimensional setting. Um, so I'm rewriting here the system in 1D and uh, now it's going to be set in the whole space. Okay, so in, in R times zero T. Um, and now to, just to fix ideas, we assume that the terminal condition is zero, but this is not needed. There, there's, there's more, we can, we, can, we can make more general assumptions. Um, and about M zero, about the initial density, uh, we assume that it's a, it is a bump-like function. So it has a bump-like shape, and that means that the, uh, the support of M0 is exactly an interval. So M0 is strictly positive on an interval. And uh, we have this power-like decay of M0 near the boundary. So, so M0 decays like a certain power uh, as X approaches the, the endpoints of the support. Okay, and this beta is, is just some number. It can be, it can be in principle, uh, any beta. Okay, uh, at least at least for the for the first set of results. Okay, so so we we're assuming that the initial density is a complex function, so it genuinely vanishes um, outside of a compact set. And and the question is, 
how does density of players evolve? How, how do the players evolve um, after this initial density? So uh, there are two distinct situations or two distinct model cases, depending on what F is, okay? So if F is equal to the logarithm, this, this, this is the first model case, then in this case, this satisfies the blow up assumption. So this, this logarithm precludes again, the appearance of empty regions. The players will occupy the empty regions. Uh, and, and in this case, we have infinite sphere propagation. This is kind of what happens with the equation. And this is, we have some results in this direction. So even we start with compact support on, in the real line, we have instant, an instant regularization result. So we, we have some results in this direction. Um, there is no free boundary because of the instant propagation of, of the support. Um, but I, I'm not going to focus too much on this. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I have a question. Uh, can mm -hmm. you describe precisely how this, uh, this happens, how you move from compact support to something positive everywhere? Like, can you, can you describe, uh, can you find the behavior of M when T goes to zero? So when t goes to zero, uh, when t goes to zero uh, outside the support of the initial uh, m, when t goes to zero, m will go to zero, right? But can you can you uh, describe that precisely? Can you find uh, uh, an equivalent or profile or something that uh, does that, or or you didn't look at this question? So th this question is, uh, we didn't look at it so much because uh, we were much more interested in the other setting. Uh, like this is more of like something we put at the end of the paper, but the okay. I would say that our, our most like detailed results are about the, the setting of the, with the free boundary. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, so the other, the other situation is where F of M is equal to M to the theta where theta is positive. So F, F is like a power. In this case, there is finite speed of propagation uh, so we have to study not just the regularity of the solution, but also the regularity of the free boundary. And I'm going to focus on this, which I think is the, is the more interesting the setting. Um, okay, so when f of m is equal to m to the theta, I, I will just begin by saying that there is a prototype solution. So there's an explicit solution to to this to this problem, uh, which which looks like this. Okay, and this solution. Um, it's kind of a fundamental solution in the sense that uh, at time zero, it is equal to a Dirac mass um, centered at x equals zero. And then the solution for, I mean, anybody who's seen the, the porous medium equation, this is very similar to the fundamental solution for the porous medium equation, the, the so-called uh, ZKB solution or the Barenblatt solution. Um, it is not exactly the same because the, 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 the exponents are a little bit different. And the scaling is not the same, but but it has the same form. It's a positive part of this of this function. Sorry, sorry, what is the R? Okay, so R is, is a positive constant chosen so that it has mass one. Okay. So, yes. So so I mean it is it is just implicitly determined. It is uniquely determined by the fact that the integral is one. Um and this is a self-similar solution. Um and then it has a it has a free boundary, which is a pair of convex curves, uh, which are spreading outward, okay? Um, and as far as regularity, uh, the solution, this explicit solution is Hölder continuous with uh, Hölder exponent one over theta, uh, f of m, um, so m to the theta is a little bit better, which is a, a Lipschitz continuous function. And uh, the second derivative is, is negative inside the support. So this is, this f of m quantity is, is important here um, it is kind of analogous to, to what happens in the porous medium equation with the pressure, because even though the, the solution to the porous medium equation is only Hölder continuous, the pressure is Lipschitz continuous. So the pressure is a little bit better than the solution itself. And that's what happens here. So if we, if we raise this expression to the power of theta, we get a Lipschitz function. And we can see that directly from the formula. And I say when I say Lipschitz, I mean uh, Lipschitz in space, uh, locally in time. And it's actually Lipschitz in space time, but only, only away from t equals zero. Um, okay, so we have a, we have this explicit solution, and this, this solution is is kind of a prototype for our results because we much of what we found is that the the general behavior um, is quite similar to to what happens with this solution. And actually, some of our assumptions are modeled by also also the assumptions themselves are modeled by the by the behavior of the solution. So, for example, this idea that 
the function f of m is Lipschitz, we find it natural to assume that the initial density has satisfied the same condition, which is that f of m zero is Lipschitz. Um, and actually, uh, we can see that the, so, so, if, if we look, uh, okay, can I ask a question? So here, uh, beta doesn't appear anymore, like beta disappeared, like the initial condition. If, if you go back, like the initial m, the initial the, m has uh, the decay. I mean, yeah, this... so it has, has this behavior at the boundary. So that you that was your behavior at the boundary, whereas now beta doesn't appear anymore. Now, okay, in, so in, 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 the, in the self similar solution, uh, for the self similar solution, the initial condition is, is a Dirac mass. So this is not this doesn't apply. So this is, this is a solution that has initial condition the Dirac mass. Uh, but something that I will say about this is that if you try to look at the decay of the self similar solution near the free boundary, it does satisfy this, and the beta is, is, is a specific number. It's one over theta. Okay, so oh, yeah. if, okay. if we go back to here, it's one over theta. Uh, yeah. Is, is that oh, okay? Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it means that you you take the initial data, not at time t equals zero, but the initial data is at time at another time. At another time, and it will have that behavior, correct? But and, and but we have it for a specific beta one over theta, and actually it turns out that uh, we choose a specific beta that is the beta that gives the strongest results. So we can we can yeah. choose an we can assume an arbitrary beta and we get some results, but the, the best results are with with that the specific beta of the self similar solution. Okay. Okay. So the first the first result is for a general beta, which is we assume that uh, besides the assumptions that I that I made before. We assume that f of m zero is Lipschitz, and it is a C one alpha up to uh, inside inside the inside the support, um, and f of m zero is uh, semi convex. So we have a lower bound on on, on the second derivative of m of f of m zero. Then the conclusion is that the solution is smooth in the set where m is positive, and the free boundary is a pair of Lipschitz curves. Okay. Uh, so that means that the set where m is positive is described as as a, as a points x uh, between these two these two curves of time, the gamma l and gamma r, the left and the right free boundary curve, respectively. And this is what happens with uh, with a self similar solution. There are there are two curves, um, and here we have Lipschitz curves. Um, but um, we we want a little bit more regularity than that because uh, we we want the free boundary to be more than Lipschitz. So to get more regularity, uh, what we do is we impose this non-degeneracy assumption, which is satisfied by the self-similar solution, which is that the second derivative of f from zero is less than or equal to zero near the the endpoints of the support. And uh, actually actually the the self-similar solution has a, satisfies this in a strict sense, but we only need it uh, less than or equal to zero. And with this assumption. Uh, if, we, if we combine this assumption with the with the assumption with the beta before, we actually see that uh, f of m zero x at, uh, at a and at b have to be strictly non-zero. So so basically f of m uh, falls with a positive slope at the at the support. And um, moreover, this condition actually forces beta to be one over theta. So if we combine this assumption with the other one, we can prove that beta is one over theta. So, uh, so, so actually, this is almost equivalent to assuming that beta is equal to one over theta. Um, and uh, I just mentioned this because this, 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 this conditions are exactly the this, this condition that f, that the pressure falls with a positive slope is exactly the non-degeneracy condition for the porous medium equation. So, so in that sense, this condition is the second order assumption is is natural, um, also natural because because it's satisfied by the self similar solution itself. Okay. Um, so if we assume if we make these assumptions, th this is a theorem. So if if f of m zero x x is less than or equal to zero near the free boundary, then m is other continuous up to the free boundary, uh, and the free boundary is w two infinity or c one one. Okay, so the so the, the curves the curves are w two infinity, uh, and furthermore, the left curve is convex, uh, and the right curve is concave. That means that the support itself is convex. Um, and uh, here, I, I should have clarified something, is that gamma L and gamma R are also monotone. 
But this is only true for the for the final cost problem, for the mean field gain problem. In the planning problem, uh, it is only only the convexity. The convexity is true in general, but the monotonicity is true for the mean field gain problem. That is the, that is when we prescribe u at the terminal time and not m. Uh, okay, so in other words, the support is a convex set and it expands outward uh, with finite speed with a C11 interface. Okay, then this is the this is the regularity result for the free boundary. And also we have the optimal regularity. And I say optimal in the sense that it's holder continuous, but it's not optimal in the sense that we don't know the optimal exponent, okay? Um, up to the free boundary. Um, this is a simulation of, of what it could, it could look like. Okay, so we have a, an initial, this is in the case theta equals one. So uh, we have an initial density, which you see there is false with positive slope, okay? Um, and then it propagates the, we see that the, the two the two uh, convex curves um, propagating with, with finite speed. Okay, so this so, is so here, uh, what are the axes here? Like uh, I'm, I'm not understanding the picture well. Uh, so where is the initial data here? Uh, the, the initial data is uh, I, I'm not sure how to explain this, but the, the, you see the what the red part is that is, that is the initial data. Ah, the red part is the initial data. Wow. Hmm. Yes. No, but time. Uh, what is time? What is time? Yeah, so, 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 um, it's hor horizontally. Uh, it is. It is um, space, space, and towards towards the screen, it will be time. Here you are plotting the exact solution. That is a, for a specific M zero. Okay? Yeah. What is M zero? Uh, it is, I mean, it, I try to make it. I try to make it as arbitrary as possible. So you you see it. You see it in the red part. That is the M zero. It, it is just some function. I made sure it was not symmetric, just to illustrate the result. Okay. okay so I mean, I I built it just by adding a bunch of cosines with each other, and I just made sure that it satisfies the assumption that they have any specific symmetry or specific shape. And this is this is what the solution looks like. Okay. Is it clear? With sorry, sorry about the labeling. Is it, is it is it clear where, where is time and what is space? No, no, for me, no. I'm not understanding. The, so, so this is one dimensional, right? So this is one dimensional and and so time. The, spa the, the space is where, 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 where we have the red part. So the support, I think. Let me see, let me see if I if I can annotate. Can, can you see what I'm annotating? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this this direction is time. Yeah. Okay. And then this direction is space. The initial condition would be would be this. Ah. Uh, okay. okay. And then the free boundary curves would be this curve, uh, and this curve over here. Okay. Okay. I see. Okay. And the self similar solution looks like this, except that the initial condition is a Dirac mass. Mm. Okay. And you see here that that this the slope of the slope. Um, let me use a different color. Uh. Here it's positive slope, okay, and that is that is sort of a, a key point that also happens with the porous medium equation. Okay, so is this yeah, clear now? I mean, am I, am I right? Like the cell, if you take the self-similar solution, if instead of this you are taking the self-similar solution, the initial data will be at the negative time, right? Like you get the delta if you go backward in time, but yes, if, yeah, yeah. So yeah, okay. Uh, okay, let me try to clear the screen. Okay. okay let me let me continue. Uh, okay, so so those are those are the main results. Uh, something I I didn't mention, and maybe I should have mentioned, is that we have a specific um, we have an exact quantification of the rate of propagation, and it is exactly the same as the rate of the self-similar solution. The, the self-similar solution spreads. With algebraic rate p to the alpha, maybe let me let me show that. Go back and show it. So you see this alpha over here. This the, the, this the the free boundary for the self similar solution spreads with rate t to the alpha. Something we showed is that in the long time, the the solution in general always spreads with the same algebraic rate t to the alpha, where alpha is given by this this exact formula two over two plus theta. So that we we can like we can find like a sharp quantification of how, how fast it's spreading and it is it is given by the prototype solution. Okay, I, I didn't write it explicitly here, but it is it is in the paper. 
Okay, so those are, those are, the, those are the main results. Uh, maybe let me discuss a little bit about the proofs and, and, and the ideas. Um, so one of the key ideas of, of, for proving these results is to analyze the problem in Lagrangian coordinates. And by, by doing that, I mean that uh, because we have a Hamilton-Jacobi equation, we can look at the characteristics of this Hamilton-Jacobi equation, and we can look at the optimal, these are going to be the optimal trajectories of the individual players. So basically, we can define this flow of optimal trajectories, which is going to top this OD, where the right-hand side is going to be minus ux of, which, which is given by the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So this, this function gamma, which is a function of the initial position of the player and uh, the time, this, this gamma is the flow of optimal trajectories. Um, and this gives the Lagrangian coordinates for the player. So at gamma of xt is the position of a player that started at position x at time t. And uh, we expect the free boundary to be exactly the, the two optimal trajectories that start at the endpoints of the support. So that means the curve gamma of at and gamma of bt. Okay. Those, the, um, so, so, so we expect that to be the free boundary. In fact, that that is that is the, that turns out to be the free boundary. Uh, but then, um, this this if, if we have this optimal trajectories, if we look at this transformation that sends x t to gamma of x t t, uh, this set of chord, this change of coordinates transforms the support of M into a rectangle, or or rather the inverse of this mapping transforms the support into a rectangle, uh, because the the, the rectangle or this, this, this interval AB is, is going to be the endpoints of the support of M0. Um, and if we map it through the optimal trajectories, we get exactly the support. Uh, so therefore, um, given this, given this, this, these comments, um, the regularity of the free boundary or proving regularity for the free boundary should be equivalent to proving boundary regularity of gamma, or, or rather pr proving regularity of gamma at the, at the sides of this rectangle. Of the, of the rectangle AB times uh, zero T. Um, okay. So what can we say about this flow of optimal trajectories? So one of the key observations uh, that we can make is that this flow satisfies an equation in its own. Okay, so it satisfies an elliptic equation, which uh, I'm writing here. Okay, this is, is, I mean, there's not much to say. It's an elliptic equation. Uh, and then this equation is a fundamental tool. Okay, so and let me let me more or less explain why this equation is useful. So because it's an elliptic equation, we can expect to use certain classical methods, things like Bernstein's method or maximum principle arguments. Um, and then, if for example, if we prove, which we we do in the paper, if we prove that gamma is Lipschitz continuous. So if we have a, if we have a bound on the first derivative of gamma, uh, we can we can conclude several things. So Having a bound on the time derivative uh, implies already that that the the boundary curves are Lipschitz. Okay, so so having a Lipschitz bound on gamma already implies that gamma L and gamma R are Lipschitz curves. Okay, so so that is one thing. But then having a bound on the x derivative also gives important information. And let, let me let me try to explain. That is a little bit less obvious. So let me try to explain that. Okay, so we saw that the bound on gamma t is immediately useful. It makes the curves Lipschitz. But uh, if, we, if we find a, a bound on gamma x, um, we can use this to characterize the free boundary. And, and what I mean by that is we can actually use it to prove that the free boundary is truly given by the two curves that start at the endpoints. Um, in the sense that, uh, that, that, I think I wrote this before, in the sense that the set where m is positive is exactly uh, the points between the two curves, okay? And let me, let me explain why this, this bound on gamma x can be used to, to prove that. So, uh, recall first that M satisfies this continuity equation. Okay, so if we have a continuity equation, we have a, a conservation of mass, and conservation of mass can be written infinitesimally in this in this form, uh, which is that um, M of gamma x t and M zero are related by this factor, which is gamma x. In, in higher dimensions, this would be the determinant of d gamma. Okay, so this, I mean, for example, in optimal transport, this is exactly the mont pair equation that that appears. Um, in, 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 that, in that specific setting, because we have the gradient of a convex map, but here is just the conservation of, conservation of mass. Okay, so gamma x uh, uh, satisfies this, this this quotient of m zero over m. So if we have an upper bound on gamma x, then that automatically means that m is bounded below by a constant multiple of m zero. Okay, this, this is just what it means 
for gamma x to be bounded in light of this conservation of mass equation. Okay, but if we look at this equation, what this means is that the positivity of m is preserved along the optimal trajectories. So we, if we start at position x and we go along the trajectory gamma of x t, then m is always going to be bounded below by a multiple of whatever m zero is. So if we start inside the support, the entire trajectory will remain uh, with a positivity uh, lower bound. Okay, so that means that there are no empty regions between the two between the two extremal curves because if we look at all the curves, they are going to be ordered, um, and then everything in between is uh, every everything in between the two the two curves is going to be uh, is going to be it's going to come from a trajectory that is strictly inside the support. So that means that there are no holes in between the curves. That means that the set where m is positive is exactly the region in between those two curves. So this characterizes the free boundary as being exactly the union of those of those two curves. And, and that is what we get from an upper bound on gamma x plus this conservation of mass property. This is just a taste of, of like um, why this, or rather, rather this is kind of a, a very, very basic uh, explanation of, of why this, this, this analysis of, of, of the Lagrangian perspective and this, this elliptic equation satisfied by gamma can be useful to study the free boundary. Of course, there's, there's much more to be said. Um, so for example, I mean, for the deeper results, like the C11 regularity of the free boundary and the holder continuity of M up to the interface, um, what we do is we study the function M in Lagrangian coordinates. That means that we study the function M of gamma XTT. So it is, it is, it is the, the, the function M after switching to Lagrangian coordinates. Okay, and, and uh, we can show that the, the so-called pressure or the analog of the pressure uh, in the porous medium equation in, in, in the setting, um, which is F of M in Lagrangian coordinates satisfies this equation in divergence form. This is an, this is an elliptic equation in divergence form satisfied by the so-called or, or the analog of the pressure, so it's by f of m. Okay, and uh, if you look at this equation, I mean, let me let me try to explain a little bit why this equation is nice. Uh, okay, so first of all, I'm, I'm leaving the equation on the screen. So first of all, uh, we see this this gamma x that appears in the in the in, in the in the equation, but this gamma x is is a positive quantity. We saw that it is the quotient of m zero and m. And it's actually bounded above and below. That's something we can prove. We can prove that gamma x is bounded above and below. Okay, so the gamma x and the gamma x inverse, we can almost at least at least uh, for a preliminary analysis, we can think of it as as constants, like as constant multiples, because it, it is bounded above and below. So really, the the if we want to understand this equation, um, we we have to look at this other factor of the theta v inverse. Okay, and this, this is the factor that tells us what is this, what is the scaling of the equation. Okay, so we can read up the intrinsic scaling of the equation, which means in, in the sense that it is much more diffusive in the time direction because we have this theta v inverse. The theta is a constant, so we have the v inverse, and v inverse is going to zero near the free boundary because v is just the pressure and it's going to zero near the free boundary. So as we approach the free boundary, this the system becomes uh, the equation becomes much more diffusive in the time direction, and the and the the, the exact scaling is given by this factor of, of the inverse, okay? And, and from this analysis, uh, we can do uh, the, Georgie Nash, the, the Georgie Nash type estimate on this equation, but, but instead of doing it on the usual balls or rectangles, we have to do it on so-called intrinsic rectangles that are adapted to the scaling of the equation, okay? And given by this, the, this observation I just made. So the, the, this observation tells us what is the scaling of the equation and how to define the intrinsic rectangles on which we can do the Georgie Nash. And this is a, I mean, this is, this is the method of intrinsic scaling, which is, uh, this is due to uh, Di Benedetto, um, originally due to Di Benedetto has been used to, to prove regularity in several different problems. Like for example, this can be used also to, to prove further continuity for the porous medium equation. Okay, but of course, every, every, every equation has a different scaling and, 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 and this, this equation um, has the one I just, I just mentioned. Okay, and this is, this is how we get the uh, other continuity. Go ahead. Let me maybe ask the uh, ask a question here. So so yeah. here you are, you are saying that since v is going to zero, so v minus one becomes large, right? So 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 it means that the v t t term has a large constant in front, right? So the yes. v t t, so it means that the v x x is less important. So it's v t t which is dominating, right? Yes. So VTT is dominating. Okay, so now what can you deduce from the fact that VTT is dominating? Uh, the, the point is that, the, the point is that you, if you do a change of variables, you can transform the equation to be uniformly elliptic. 
Uh -huh. okay. if, if, if you work on a, on, a, on, a, on a rectangle that is longer on one side and shorter on the other, at, according to this, to this scaling, then you will get a uniform elliptic equation, at least morally speaking. Okay, okay, I see. And, and yeah, so, so, so that's why, but we, ha we have to choose exactly the correct rectangle and, and, and the rectangle is, 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 the, is determined by the value of V at the center of the rectangle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, this is, I just, I just giving some, some ideas of, of how this analysis works. I mean, there is, a, there is really uh, too much, too much to, I, I cannot get into all the details, but um, these are some of the, some of the ideas. Um, Yes, and I mean this is this is what I had prepared. For this. These are the references, and uh, thank you very much for for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for the talk. Thank you, thank you, Sebastian, for the talk. So let's pass to the questions. So, are there any questions, please? Maybe I will start. So, in the first question, so you mentioned that. It's uh, it's only in one one D. So what is the the issue to extend this result? I mean for multi dimension. Okay, the, the, the result is not only on one D. Uh, it is it is on one D if we remove the blow up assumption. So so either you take the blow up assumption and then it works for arbitrary dimension, or you take one D and then in, and then in one D we don't need the blow up assumption. Um, but uh, I guess the question is would be the what is the obstruction to removing the blow up assumption in in, yeah. in higher dimensions? Yeah. Um, and basically the, the the situation is that um, some of the things that we use are uh, what, what are called in optimal transport uh, displacement convexity estimates. So just like in optimal transport, there are displacement convexity formulas, uh, which basically state that you have convexity of certain functionals along the trajectories. Um, displacement convexity results are, are much stronger in one dimension. So for example, we can prove that uh, the, the, the minimum of, of M is actually achieved at the endpoint. So that means that M satisfies the minimum principle. That is That happens in 1D. Okay. But, uh, and because of that, we have, a, we have this preservation of positivity that, that allows us to, to get the uniform elliptici. Okay, but, so basically it is, it is the fact that the displacement convexity estimates degenerate uh, for higher dimensions. Yeah, okay. So uh, in the same way, so in the case of non-separable uh, Hamiltonian, so this assumption, it's, I think, it doesn't make any sense in the, that case, mm -hmm. no? You mean when, when you have H of PM? Yeah, yeah. P and M. Yeah, no, no. I mean, uh, for example, I mean, I mean, you, you don't. I mean, uh, it doesn't. Uh, it does make sense to have this blow up condition of uh, of uh, f when the Hamiltonian it's not, not it's not uh, separable. You can you can still you can still get results if you if you if you formulate the analog the analog property. Okay, for example, um, in my I mean, paper physics, about. I mean, the, I mean, I mean, physically, physically, it, it makes sense or not? To, to, uh, to... I, would, I would say, I would say yes. I would say still, still yes, because it's, it's basically a, a, an incentive for the players to 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 not f allow empty regions. So it is, it is still there's it's still a cost, but it, it is it is a, it is a cost that is coupled between the the velocity and the and the mm -hmm. density. But I would say it's, it still makes the same physical sense. You're still imposing a very strong incentive. For the players to occupy low density regions. Okay, so for the second question, uh, for for your second question, I think in the case of second MFG. So what? Uh, it, that, uh, I think the diffusion help help you to 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 get more regularity. No? Um, say that again. Sorry. I mean, I mean for the uh, second order um, MFG. In the case when you have, I mean, viscosity in the equation, so I think in in the 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 viscosity, it's help you to get more regularity. Well, not not necessarily. Um, so I will say that in this specific setting, this specific when you have specifically this Hamiltonian, uh, you can get smooth solutions in that setting just by using the Kolhoff transform. 
but that is because of the specific form of the Hamiltonian. Uh, but the results I'm mentioning here are, are true for other Hamiltonians as well. Um, but then the result, the regularity results for this so the setting with diffusion, uh, they require uh, some growth conditions on the right hand side. So F can, can only grow like a power and this power is like a very small power. Uh, if, if you assume that, then you get smooth solutions. But if you have a, if you don't have that condition, then the solutions are not even are not even classical. Um, yeah. So so the, the second order case doesn't give as much regularity as one would expect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, are there any more questions, please? Yeah. So um, so in a sense, it, the heuristic that you mentioned in this slide, like the fact that the problem is elliptic in Tx, right? When you wrote mm -hmm. that equation on V, you, you were using the same heuristic. Uh, that, that, <laughs> uh, yes, correct. It is, it is the same. Yes, all the, all the elliptic equations I mentioned here are elliptic equations in space-time. And they are coming from the same heuristic, right? You are correct. using that M is a slave to you. So if you know you, you can recover M by this F minus one, right? Correct. But uh, the, the the equation you get here, um, <laughs> that I didn't write it down, is much uglier than the other one I showed. The, the, the one I showed allows you to read off this, the exact scaling very easily, whereas this equation is is, is much more difficult to understand. In and that's sense, where the, the, the switch equation... to the Lagrangian coordinates helps. Right, so the V equation you introduced is better behaved than the U equation you have here. Yes, it's, it's easier to understand. Okay. Now, if F is not strictly increasing, so if you allow F, uh, if the derivative of F can vanish somewhere, <clears throat> Uh, will that be a problem? Like then, then this heuristic will not be correct anymore, right? Uh, yes, it, it's it, it is a, it is a problem. Uh, you can but, still but 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 results. on the other hand, but on the other hand, if you assume that f is uh, strictly increasing close to zero, because I guess for for your free boundary kind of question about how the support is increasing, you, in a sense, you only need, uh, you only need to understand F when M is very small, right? So the behavior of F when M is equal to one or two is not uh, important to understand how the free boundary is, uh, is evolving, right? Uh, but still, but so, still, I guess your argument is 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 a global, right? You have to put everything, right? So, it is it is global in the sense that uh, every everything here is sort of operating under the the assumption that the gradient is not too large because you can get a gradient estimate, but the the gradient bound requires the monotonicity of f. So there could be some issues if, if you if you make if you localize the, the monotonicity like that. It's it's not so clear that it would work because as as you said, the argument is is global. Um, yes, but I mean, I I, I think it's, it could work still. Yeah. I think an interesting. I mean, I I, I don't know whether anyone thought about this, but uh, now if you put a small parameter in front of the f epsilon, if you put epsilon in front of f, then you can study what happens when epsilon goes to zero. And maybe you can mm -hmm. try to recover the optimal transport kind of uh, results. Uh, yes, yes, this is something. This is something you can do. Uh, I mean, actually, the so something I didn't I didn't mention. Uh, so this result uh, with the blob assumption that I mentioned, this result was extended. I, I proved it for the torus, but this result was extended by Alessio Porretta uh, for Neumann boundary conditions and the whole space. And in his paper, he his right hand side is has the form f plus epsilon log um because oh. he was planning to let epsilon go to zero to recover some results from optimal transport but mm -hmm. in the end he didn't really do that i mean like he didn't his paper, the paper had a different focus but his initial idea was to do exactly what you're saying so so right. yeah this is something that people have thought about before but i don't think there's anything published necessarily about this i mean it will be just recovering known known results 
Um, but yes, I, I agree with you that you can you can do those things. Okay. 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 Thank you. So, are there any more questions, please? Okay, so maybe okay, let's thank again Sebastian. Thank you, Sebastian, for the nice talk. Thank you very much for the invitation.